Hello, good morning. Oh my gosh, you made it here in time. We found our way here. Um, let me start. I'm very excited about this. And you know, the best part is I hope that um, you will listen to these incredible women leaders and then we will leave the last 20 minutes for your questions. So women leaders face increasing challenges around the world and the online attacks against them. You know, we've now chronicled the data around this, women politicians, women researchers, journalists. So these online attacks against women, sexism and misogyny against leaders, they're often information operations or information warfare. They often herald the erosion of democracy around the world. This is certainly true in my country, in the Philippines. Uh, it is not a coincidence that you know, the attacks against me, for example, as a journalist, I was getting 90, 90 hate messages per hour, right? And it was followed a year later by lawfare, the same attacks top down. Well, in my country, a former Senator, Lila de Lima, uh, is about to begin her seventh year in prison. And of course, I have to remind you, in Iran, where this year's Nobel Peace Prize winner, Nargis Mohammadi, remains in prison, there women lead the fight. Like in many parts of the world, their cry in Iran, women, life, freedom. So let me introduce you to the two with us today. The Right Honorable Jacinda Ardern became the Prime Minister of New Zealand at just 37 years old. We all remember all of the articles around that, about that time. Um, she, was, she became pregnant and gave birth in office. As a woman leader of a Five Eye Nation, she was also the target of information operations, warfare at times, analysts say, from both Russia and China. She faced the challenges of a live-streamed domestic terror attack against New Zealand's Muslim community, a volcanic eruption, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Jacinda's focus on people, kindness, and what she called pragmatic idealism saw New Zealand achieve some of the lowest losses of life experienced by any developed nation through the pandemic, carried through a ban of military-style semi-automatic weapons in her country, and she created the Christchurch Call to Action to eliminate violent extremism online. She is now the Prime Minister, Special Envoy to the Christchurch Call. She joins us, oh, you don't see her yet, but she joins us from the United States. On stage with me, please meet a fellow member of the leadership panel of the Internet Governance Forum, we were appointed by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, just a little over a year ago. Uh, Caroline Edstadler uh, is Austria's Federal Minister for the EU and the Constitution, one of the smartest voices in our close discussions uh, to help shape the internet we want. She's a lawyer by training and a former judge, also a former member of the European Parliament, and she was the head of delegation of the Austrian People's Party. My name is Maria Ressa. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rappler in the Philippines. Yes, my news organization survived six years of harassment and lawfare. I'm the vice chair of the leadership panel of the Internet Governance Forum. And in order to be here in Kyoto to be with you this morning, I had to ask the courts all the way to the Supreme Court for permission to travel. So thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. We want to try to make this more free-flowing than, than, uh, than we've had so far. We're going to leave time, as, as I told you at the end, for your questions, roughly 20 minutes. And Jacinda and Carolyn, please feel free to interrupt me to ask questions of each other. Uh, it is an honor to be speaking with you both. Let's see if we can get, um, if you can see the, uh, the former prime minister, Jacinda Ardern. Hello, Jacinda. Yes. Kia ora and hello. Hopefully the technology is working. We hear you. Yay. Um, okay, let me toss. I can see you here. <laughs> let me toss the first question. You know, um, I 
talked a lot about, I'm gonna start with the women leaders. Being a woman leader, you talked about pragmatic idealism. You know, how did you shape that and, and how has that given you the courage to make these difficult decisions that I had mentioned beforehand? Oh, and, and look, um, you know, you could put any uh, agenda item uh, in this tumultuous period of time in which leaders are leading and being asked to govern. Uh, and I would say that in my mind, one of the most important approaches is to always uh, set out your destination, you know, be it the technological, uh, rapid technological development that we face or climate challenges or issues of inequality. It's very easy to get caught up in the day to day of what it is that needs to be resolved with each of these issues. But I think it's incredibly important that we still signpost uh, to our public and to our citizens what the end destination is. Uh, and pragmatic idealism, in my mind, is, is being ambitious in that signaling. Set out your overall goal, but then be pragmatic about the time it may take or the steps um, that you may take along the way. Uh, now, of course, we'll get into a discussion around the rapid technological development that we're experiencing now and how difficult it is to set out an endpoint when we really don't know. So in that set of circumstances, I'd say it's probably more important that we set out our values on that journey and the things that we'll seek to uphold in an environment of extreme uncertainty. Great, we'll come back. Carolyn, let me toss a similar question to you. You I mean, you have, you're helping lead through an extremely tumultuous time, Ukraine, um, Hungary through here, all of the different, issues that you've had to handle. How do you maintain, how do you deal with these difficult decisions? Well, first of all, good morning and thank you so much, Maria, for organizing this. It's really a big honor for me to sit on the same panel, even if you're not here, Jacinda, with you. Uh, you are really also a role model for women and it's a pleasure that I have the impression I'm getting also a role model by by hearing what you said about me. So um, I would say you can break it down with a joke which is, of course, only a joke, but this goes the following. The last 2,000 years, the world has been ruled by men. The next 2,000 years, the world will be ruled by women. It can only get better. But this is not the end of the story, because we are living in a very diverse world. We are living in a challenging world, and I think we need both, the approach of women and of men. But the difference is, and Yacinda already mentioned, being ambitious is something very important, that we women are judged and seen in a different way. If you are ambitious as a woman, you're the pushy one. You're the one you want to get the position of a man, and so on and so forth. And I think what we as a society have to learn is that we need both ways of seeing the world. And we, men, uh, we women can make a difference because we are giving birth. We are mothers. We are really yeah, perce perceiving the life. And I think this is also why we are different than men. And that's good. There is nothing bad in it. And especially in times like that, you mentioned a few of the crises we are still going through. Um, it's very important to have both ways of seeing the world, both assessments of, of female and male. And one last thing, um, I think we women are still not that good than men in um, making uh, better networks in holding together, in encouraging uh, ourselves. And that's why I founded a conference uh, last year in August in Salzburg, which is called The Next Generation is Female. And it's not about things against men. It's with the support of strong men. And it's really for female leaders in Europe to get together, to network, to exchange themselves, and to have personal um, chains also and, and encourage ourselves because it's not easy and we will uh, go into details also uh, regarding hatred in the internet and being judged as a woman. And that's where we'll go. You know, I, I uh, for the men, I hope you find this as inclusive. Part of the reason I started this way is because the attacks against women online are literally off the scale. When I talk to reporters um, who are, in, in some instances, covering male leaders who are misogynist, um, their editors tell them, you know, buckle up, it's not, it's not our problem. 
But I think one of the things that we want to lay out is that it is a problem of the technology, it is an incitement of the technology, and it is knocking women's voices out of the public debate. Let me bring it back to what exactly we're talking about, the technology that is shaping our world today. And one of the most interesting things Jacinda Ardern did was a very strong reaction to the live streaming of a terrorist attack. Um, it was the first time that a government literally took, asked all news organizations around the world to take out the name of the attacker. So this, this was, I was surprised when, when we got this, but when we thought about it, I was like, oh, well, that kind of makes sense. But also to try to deal with taking down this footage from all around the world. Um, Jacinda, you've pointed to the Christchurch Initiative as a multi-stakeholder solution for eliminating terrorist and extremist content online. What did it succeed in doing, and where can you see that moving forward, given the landscape we're working in today? Thank you. A really big question, uh, but uh, I hope that there are some useful lessons to be learned. Where we've succeeded, where we have more work to do. So uh, I assume that a number of people in the room uh, will have a bit of prior knowledge about the Christchurch Call to Action. Uh, which is over 150 now strong with uh, member organizations uh, made up of and supporters made up of the likes of, of government, uh, civil society and uh, uh, technology uh, membership and platforms. But taking a step back, why did we create this grouping in the first place? Well, as you say, on the 15th of March in 2019, we experienced a horrific domestic terror attack against our Muslim community. It was live streamed on Facebook for a total of 17 minutes uh, and then subsequently uploaded a number of times uh, over the following days. It was just prolific. People were encountering it without seeking it. Uh, and you're right to acknowledge that in some cases it was in people's feeds because it was being reposted by news outlets or referenced by news outlets. Now, in the aftermath of that, of course, New Zealanders had a very strong reaction. You know, this should never have been able to happen. Um, but now that it's happened to us, what can we do to try and prevent it happening again? And we took an approach that was uh, not just about how, how do we address the fact that live streaming itself became uh, a platform for this horrific attack, because if we just focused on that, that's a relatively narrow brief. And we know that the tools that are used for violent extremism or by a violent extremist or terrorist online, they're going to change. Live streaming was a tool at that time. The response was ill-coordinated by other um, tech uh, platforms for a number of reasons. Uh, so work needed to be done there, yes, but we also wanted to make sure that we were ready and fit for purpose should other uh, um, new forms of technology be the uh, order of the day for those violent extremists. So the Christchurch Call to Action has a number of objectives. Uh, some of them are things like creating a crisis response model so that we are able to stand up quickly should anything like this occur again. And we have not seen an act at the scale and magnitude of Christchurch online since then. And that's in part because we now have this almost civil defense model. But we also said, how does someone become radicalized in the first place? Acknowledging that in our case, the terrorists involved acknowledged themselves that they believe themselves were being radicalized by YouTube. Now, you know, people will debate whether or not they believe that to be case, the case, but regardless, there were questions there to be asked around what we can do as governments within our own societies, but also to better understand these pathways. You know, what is curated, how is curated content uh, and algorithmic outcomes driving particular um, behavior online? So we've got a large piece of work now looking at understanding that better. And these, I think, uh, are areas where our learnings will be hugely beneficial much more broadly. That's fantastic. Let me follow up with that, which is, you know, last week or I guess a week and a half or so ago, I taught a class with Hillary Clinton and the Dean of SIPA, um, Karen Yari Millo, where we looked at, at the radicalism that comes with the virulent ideology of terrorism, right? How that radicalizes people. But one of the things we did in the class was to show how similar it is with what we are going through now on a larger scale with, with political extremism. Are there 
any lessons from the Christchurch approach and the pillars that you've created, uh, how to deal with radicalization, for example, that, that we can learn to combat the polarization we're dealing with globally? Good question. Yeah, you know, where I come at it from is our starting point was how did this individual become so radicalized that they were driven to fly to our country, embed themselves in a community, and then plan an attack against our Muslim community and take 51 lives? How, how is it that that can happen and what can we do to prevent it? And now the learnings from that may be applicable across a range of different areas and a range of different sources of motivation and rationales, whatever they may happen to be presented by, by the individual. Um, but what we, one common denominator that we determined was that uh, despite the uh, ideology that might be driving the behavior was that we couldn't actually answer some of these questions uh, because so often there would be this issue around, well, privacy, um, intellectual property, it was very hard to get an insight uh, into how, for instance, algorithms might be driving some of this, um, some of this behavior, if indeed it is. Uh, and so we took a step back and thought over time, uh, pulled together a group of uh, individuals as in governments and platforms uh, who were willing to put funding into creating a privacy enhancing tool which will enable researchers to look at uh, the, the data that we need to look at in order to understand these pathways. And that will enable researchers across a range of fields to better understand that user journey and that curated content, help understand what successful off-ramps look like, and I hope further prevent this kind of radicalization online. No, that's a perfect example. And Caroline, you were in the EU. The EU has been ahead. And data being one of the key factors for how we're able to, to see the patterns and trends that influence behavior. I mean, could you tell us about the EU's approach to its democracy action plan and then now rolling out the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act? Well, I think... Um, at times like this, we should do everything in parallel. And there are so many crises and so many challenging challenges uh, we should uh, find our, an answer for that it is really quite hard to do so. But I really think that the European Union is regarding the AI Act um, ahead. And if I'm saying ahead, I mean we are, of course, lacking back because we should have been uh, quicker. But the developments were so quick in the last two years, I would say um, that it is normal like that. So now we are really trying to do something uh, regarding the AI to have a, a, a framework for AI to have a classification of the risks of AI. And I think that is something very important to classify the risks because there are some applications they do not harm us. We need them, uh, I don't know, uh, for some spam filters. It's not, not, not doing a risk. But on the other hand, we have uh, AI which is really harming the whole of our society. And this is the one thing. The other thing is that we already have the DSA and the DMA in the European Union. And um, I can proudly say that we in Austria were pushing that a lot. Uh, and we already started a process in 2020 to have a legal framework in Austria. And it was, I have, I would say, now I put it uh, diplomatically, I had a lot of discussions also with the European level because they were not happy that we wanted to have an Austrian uh, legal framework for that. But I knew that it will last for at least two years to create it in the European Union. And we were really quicker in Austria. We had the Communications Platform Act uh, set into place from the 1st of January 2021. And th this is something where the social media platforms have to deal with that issue. They have to do reports. They have to set up, a, they had to set up a system um, where someone who has hatred in the internet uh, can push a button and say, this is against me, do something, delete it now, because it's uh, going around the world very quickly and, and you as a victim um, should be helped in the minute uh, it, it comes across. So 
now we have the DSA and the DMA, and of course we have to reveal our legislation, but this was also my goal, to have first the national uh, level, then the European, and now I'm here as a member of the leadership panel, and really try to create something for the universe. So this is uh, for, for the whole international community, and this is something which is not easy, because, of course, different governments coming from different standpoints have different um, assessments of the situation. But in general, it's about human beings treating and have, have the need to treat uh, this yeah, big thing of danger also for our whole society, uh, as Jacinda also said, and as we saw uh, in her country with this really horrifying um, attack, terrorist attack. No, that's from the data from the Philippines that we've looked at and analyzed um, in the Nobel lecture in 2021, I called social media, the, the tech companies, behavior modification systems. And I will tweet the data that shows that as well as the impact we saw in our society. So let me ask our two leaders, you know, for social media, the first time that machine learning and artificial intelligence was really allowed to insidiously manipulate humanity at scale. You're talking about, at that point, maybe 3.2 billion, right? Deployed at scale across platforms, because it doesn't just stay in one. There was a lot of public debate and a lot of lobbying money that was focused around downstream solutions, right? The way I think about it is, you know, the there's a factory of lies. I mean, you would have seen this already, that is spewing lies into our information ecosystem, the river. And what we tend to focus on in the public is content moderation. Content moderation is like taking a glass of water from the river, cleaning it up, and then dumping it back into the river. So, you know, how can we move away from these downstream solutions like content moderation more into structural problems like design. The fact that MIT in 2018 said lies spread six times faster on these technology platforms than really boring facts. So that, that design allowed surveillance for profit, right? A business model that we didn't name until Shoshana Zuboff wrote a book called Surveillance Capitalism in 2019. That just meant that we were retrofitting, we were reacting to the problems after they materialized. Now that we're in the age of generative AI, I wonder how we can avoid being reactive. Why should the harm come first before we protect the people here. I know it's a, it's a tough question to throw at you, but let me give you an example, for example, of like the pharmaceutical industry. Um, there was a COVID vaccine that we were all looking for. Like imagine if the COVID, the pharmaceutical companies didn't have to first test it, that they could test it in public. So this group A, I'm gonna give you vaccine A, and this group here, I'm gonna give you vaccine B. Oh, group A, I'm so sorry, you died. <laughs> I only say that because it is exactly what happened in Myanmar, for example, where both the UN and, and META sent uh, uh, teams to study genocide in Myanmar. So can we do anything to find, to prevent these types of harms happening and Caroline first or just Caroline? Well, I would say the first thing is to raise the awareness, to, to take it as it is, to raise the awareness and uh, to allow people education and give them skills to deal with that. The second thing, and this is what we are trying to do, we are doing that also in the leadership panel, uh, is to set some legal framework in place. And I would say it should be a regulation that is not hindering innovation, because we know that the developments are quick, they are needed, and they can be used for the best of us. But we have to learn to handle them and also to handle the downsides. And now it, it, it said like very easily, put some legal framework in place, but it's not so easy because I'm sure that we will lag behind also in the future. And I sometimes compare that with my um, former 
profession as a criminal judge. As a criminal judge, you're sitting at the courtroom, but you never have all the information the perpetrator has. And you're always behind. But you, in the end, have to deal with it, and you can deal with that. And I think that's the, the same approach we have to use uh, in the regard of new technologies of AI and all the things coming along. And we already proved that it is possible to do so with the DSA and the DMA, and before uh, with uh, the legal framework we put in place in Austria, because maybe two more sentences to that. When I started the process in 2020, and when I invited the social media platforms to get into a dialogue with me about hatred in the internet and what we can do against it, and that we want to put up a legal framework from the parliamentarian side, because we as democracies are represented by the parliamentarians and we are ruled by governments, they said, oh no, you don't have to do that because we are so good in handling the hatred in the internet. We are deleting all the hate postings and so on. We don't need a legal framework from the nation, national uh, state or okay. from, I don't know, the EU. And now we have it. And now I think almost all of them are quite okay with them, let's put it like that. And we are now in a, in a process also here in Tokyo, we were in Addis Abeba, getting into an exchange, uh, exchanging our experiences and also the expectations of society and this is a good development. No, oh, fantastic. Jacinda, your thoughts? Upstream solutions for generative AI. And, and look here, you know, I think that that sentiment that you shared in uh, instigating this part of the conversation around how do we put in place guardrails before the fact, this has to be, I think, one of our key take homes over the last, you know, 10, 10 years uh, or more. And, and I think we're naturally seeing, I think, a, a, a hesitancy or a skepticism in the public as a result of the fact that we've been retrofitting solutions to try and prevent harms after the fact. Uh, Pew released some research, I believe it was recently, demonstrating that roughly half of people were uh, are quite negative about uh, the relative benefits of AI and those who know more are even more um, negative. Uh, now, in part, that will be because we are talking so much about the potential harms and there isn't that same emphasis on, on the opportunities that exist. But I also think it speaks to the experience in recent times of the public and the fact that this is, you know, it's relatively rare to have a field of work uh, where just because you can, you do. As in, we have the ability to develop this tech and so we, we push ahead, even though there are those who are flagging risks and flagging harm. What I'm, I'm an optimist though, and I think what I find really encouraging is that we are having these open conversations around the concerns that exist and included in those conversations are those who are at the forefront of the tech itself. And this is where I come back to the fact that uh, I, as a past regulator, uh, I am not in the best position to tell you precisely the prescription for those guardrails, but I can tell you in my experience the best methodology to developing them. And that in my mind will always be in this fast paced environment, not to solely take a regulatory approach, although it's an incredibly important part of the mix, but because of the rapid pace uh, in, in which uh, we see these technologies developed. Um, and you know, the, the multiple, I think, intersections and, and perspectives we need at the table that a multi-stakeholder approach that includes companies, government and civil society is incredibly important. Uh, and, you know, in, in my mind, that is, even if I can't give you the prescription, I'm absolutely, uh, I absolutely believe that will be the how. One other thing I did not anticipate when we set up uh, the Christchurch call to action and when we convened a group of that nature, was the fact that the companies themselves created a natural tension amongst themselves. Uh, those who were willing to do the least were, were pulled up by those who were willing to do the most. There was full exposure over, you know, those issues where they might have been up, that might have said previously in a one-on-one, -on -one, that's not possible. You got a tension there where others were, were they, they knew that it wasn't possible just to speak to a regulator as though they were unfamiliar with, with the tech or, or with the um, parameters they were operating within because they were in a room with those who did understand. And I think that's particularly important in an area where this is so fast paced, it is highly technical. Uh, we need that, that tension, um, I think, in the room as well. The final thing I'd say is there are opportunities here. 
AI may well help us in some areas where we have previously struggled uh, with some of those existing issues that we might might have been spoken to around um, uh, content moderation, social media, and so on. And naturally, so many of these things just collide in these conversations. Uh, and so we, we should keep looking for those opportunities. But I, for one, am always one to take a, um, a risk-based approach, and I'll always look for the guardrails. Fantastic. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then if you have questions, please just go to the microphones. Um, we're coming up on the last 20 minutes. So this last one, so we've tackled the first contact with AI. This, we've looked at generative AI, and yes, the, the, the EU's um, doctrine on the AI. There's lots of doctrine, doctrines that have been pushed out already, but Let's talk about the use of AI in law enforcement and surveillance. Um, the concerns that have been raised about civil liberties, about privacy, what guardrails can we put in place to protect human rights? And I'm going to toss that first to Jacinda. Yeah, this is this is where we should not be starting from scratch. You know, liberal democracy should pull from the toolkit of human rights, um, uh, privacy, you know, these, these are well-established rules and norms. Now, where, if indeed there is any nuance in that discussion for any particular area, and often it should be relatively black and white, but if there is any nuance in the discussion, that is where civil society, in my mind, has to be at the table. Uh, and again, you know, not to harp on about the importance of the multi-stakeholder approach, but let's let's first and foremost not forget that we have well-established human rights practices, privacy laws, and we sh this should be our fallback position. Uh, any question mark over that, then civil society alongside government should be really a, a good pressure point in those conversations. And this is where I would encourage civil society to to come up stronger. We must because uh, the use of Pegasus and predator, the increasing conflicts all around us. Caroline, the same question to you. What guardrails can we also put? Well, I fully second what Jacinda said. I don't think that we have to invent the wheels newly. There is already a human rights-based order in the world, even if we see, especially since February last year, that uh, some are really disobeying everything we uh, concluded uh, to follow. But uh, coming back to the, to the internet and technology uh, side, I think we have to guarantee a rules-based approach in this regard. And uh, I also fully second that AI and all the other technologies can be used and are already used to the best of all of us. Think of the medicines. Uh, they are used for operations. They can do it much more precisely than a human person could ever do it. And, and this helps us, of course. And also in the law enforcement, you asked. Um, I recently uh, heard a presentation also in Austria um, before uh, lawyers and barristers. And it was also told that in the future, of course, law firms will use AI in finding the judgments, in structuring the knowledge quicker. But the question is, to which point will we go? Will in the end be there a judge, not a judge, but some technology sitting and deciding if someone um, has to be sent to prison or not? So this is really where we should uh, draw a line. And this is what we are trying within the European Union with the AI Act to structure the risks of AI. And I, I really do think that this is the way we could guarantee that these technologies are used for the best of us. Of us. And of course, we also have to be clear, there is always a downside. But let's handle these downsides and then it's better for all of us. Great. Any, the mic is open for any questions from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, mic? Do I have a, okay. Uh, please hi. say your uh, name and then to whom you want to uh, yeah. throw the question. I'm, I'm Larry Maggot and I'm the CEO of Connect Safely. And I guess I'm here for some advice because we are writing a parents and educator guide to generative AI. And we've got a journalist here, we've got a couple of politicians who are really good at talking to the general public. So how would you address parents, educators, people who don't have a technical knowledge of what GAI is, 
uh, to reassure them that it's probably not the end of the world, at least initially, but also warn them that there are significant risks and focus a little bit on what they can do within their own families and classrooms to mitigate the risk for those people, their, for the kids and themselves. Thank you. Caroline, you want to take it? Well, I think um, it's, it's true. The reality is sometimes uh, that children are explaining the parents how to use the phone, or they are not doing so, and they are simply using their phones and doing things the parents didn't want them to do with the phones. So I think it's also, uh, it's also something we as governments um, have to try to put into some legislation or, let's say, information campaigns um, to get the knowledge and the skills to the people. And this is, uh, of course, a big, big challenge because um, we have to also train elder people uh, because they used these things, but there is, again, always a downside of it. And this is something we can only do together. We had some, some campaigns also in Austria and some, um, yeah, some, some trainings for elder people and we had a lot of discussions also how to train parents. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have the, the, the answer how to do, but I think this is the way forward uh, to exchange also our experiences in different countries, what works and how it can work. Great, thank you. Um, uh, this is such a good question. You know, I, I was in the generation that really sat in that uh, really interesting transition point where, you know, we went from being students who were taught how to use the Dewey Decimal System to find a book in a library. And once you'd figured out how to find in a book in a library, you had found your fact and your resource. To then being in a period where we were, of course, uh, inundated with the ability to seek information at our fingertips. Um, but we weren't really taught, I think, as successfully that what we then found on that shelf might not necessarily be the fact that we thought we were finding before. And the way that my I had a history teacher who was extremely influential for me growing up, who described it as going from a hose to a fire hydrant for kids. So regardless of the particular tech at any given time, be it generative AI or whatever else we may encounter in the future, I would hope that we teach our kids to be curious, not cynical, but curious. And now the tools that we have may be giving the impression that we're going from a fire hydrant back down to a really well-refined hose but that water has been derived from a particular source in a particular way. And we need to teach kids just to be curious about that, to go back, not just from the information in front of them, but think a couple of layers back and think critically in a couple of layers back. So I would sum it up with just curiosity in everything. I think that is going to help us with this, with the age of disinformation, with the rapid technological change, and I hope create a generation that is not cynical as a result. Fantastic. Hi, good morning. My name is Michael. I'm the executive director of the Forum on Information and Democracy. Hi, Michael. It's very intimidating to be in front of greatness, but I'll <laughs> try to ask a good question. One of the themes I've heard today, and, and yesterday in fact, was the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach to finding solutions. And, uh, and my question is specifically around the participation of civil society. It's very easy for governments to show up. It's very easy for companies to show up, particularly in an environment where pay to play is so pervasive, where you pay a few hundred thousand dollars, your CEO can show up and speak at an event, you can host a session in a panel, you can capture the narrative. It's not so easy for civil society. You can't just buy a business class ticket and get on a plane the next day and show up at an event. So, if we're going to really advance a multi-stakeholder approach, what are some solutions to ensure civil society, especially those from the global south, can participate effectively? I like the global south. Let's, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, I can only say we try really to include civil society. And I think also the understanding is there that we can tackle these problems and issues only together not the government alone, not the parliamentarians alone, not the civil society, not the tech uh, enterprises, but only we as a civil society together and 
I really mean all of us, including the government. And we are doing that in Austria also. I give you an example for the implementation of the SDGs. Um, I will go back on Wednesday and we'll have the third dialogue forum on SDGs where we really, really invite uh, also the civil society uh, to, yeah, to contribute, to tell us what they are doing. And this is the same here. You can't do it bottom down. You can only do it bottom up. Jacinda, and then after Michael's question, let's take three questions and then, and then we, we can give it to both of them. Jacinda, your response to that? Um, well, uh, firstly, I was actually going to say, Marie, that you would be a really good person to speak to this yourself. So maybe you should um, have a punt at the question. My very brief contribution would be that, Michael, I, I totally agree with you. Early on in the call, um, you know, most of my interactions were you know, with civil society at the table because that was what we were building. We wanted to, to be a structure uh, where civil society were at the table. As you say, there are some real practical things to overcome in creating a network of that nature. Um, there are, and they may well be in the room, I can't see the room, but if anyone from our Christchurch call network is there, I'd ask them to give a quick raise of their hand and just to share uh, at some point whenever is appropriate uh, their experience, we certainly have learned as we've gone over the last four years around how we can make it easier um, that at a practical level and, and meaningful that engagement. But the fact we are still going, and I think it is still seen as a valuable network, I hope means we are doing some things right, but also learning as we go because we're not perfect. But I'd hand back to you, dear moderator. <laughs> Thanks, Jacinda. I mean, Michael, you know there are, there are these times when civil society comes together. Um, we have coming up the Paris Peace Forum coming in. Over the last few years, that's been one way that we've been able to get civil society together, but frankly, not enough, I think. And there are many different groups like Tallinn in Estonia uh, has just handed over the open government partnership to Kenya, right? We are, there are all these different groups that are working together partly some on past problems that could evolve to take on the, uh, you know, I'm a journalist, so information is power. And that is, to me, the top problem. If we do not solve the corruption of the information ecosystem, we cannot solve anything, let alone climate change, right? Let me throw, let's take three questions, and then, then, our, then our leaders can answer them. Please. Good morning, Svetlana Zens, Article 19. I work on the program which actually engages civil society talking to tech sector. My main countries are China, Vietnam, and Myanmar. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is the following. I mean, all the European initiatives regarding controlling and let's say monitoring the private sector, especially ICT sector, working in European territories are great. And of course, it's a human rights centric, I mean, some of the CSOs in Europe might not agree with me, but in comparison with Myanmar, for instance, <laughs> they're very good uh, points to follow. So my question is that all that private sector, which is regulated in Europe, especially with the Digital Act or Digital EA Act, how would you monitor their actions in the countries with authoritarian regimes? Great. Thank you. Um, go Hi, yeah. I'm Viet Vu from the Dais in Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, Maria, we had you in March at our Democracy Exchange and on Democracy in Power, and so it's related to that. How do you square the fact that much of the people who are most susceptible to misinformation and disinformation are the kind of people who lack fundamental trust in structures and institutions? I'm sure there are strange conspiracies about what we're doing in this room today. Um, how do you reach those people? Great. Lack trust. And we'll take one more. Um, yes, I think, I hope it's not a, too big of a question, but um, we are being told as humanity that privacy and safety cannot coexist in the online world. We are being told that because the technology is the way it is and because uh, we are faced with design choices that, that they currently exist, privacy cannot be absolute if there is any consideration of safety and safety cannot be guaranteed to anybody because we have to really care about privacy. Um, my question to you is, how can we take a step back and think about human rights and start from there and then think about design choices uh, instead of ending up, to be honest, in very stupid debates about like 
little technology choices, the little technology um, uh, bits and pieces that we need to be working on to overcome challenges and get to the place where we can have both. Uh, we really need your help as thought leaders, so any thoughts about that would be really welcome. Fantastic. Um, let me toss it, uh, Jacinda, you first, Caroline, and then I'll pick up some of the questions too. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll track through, maybe through the last two, I'll leave the first one um, um, to others. Uh, just starting on that last one around the um, safety debate and the privacy debate. You know, I, I shared very briefly uh, one experience we had with that, but it persisted for years because as I, you know, as uh, I said with the Christchurch call, for instance, we didn't want to just look at downstream, we wanted to go upstream, we wanted to look at, you know, those things that may be contributing to radicalization. Algorithm outcomes kept coming up, privacy then kept coming up. Well, we've then demonstrated with the establishment of this tool that you can overcome that debate. Um, it did take some resource to establish this tool, but the Christchurch call initiative on algorithmic outcomes, which now has researchers who are now in real time accessing what previously we were told was information for privacy reasons we would not be able to get to. Now, the next step for us will be demonstrating that that research can prove valuable uh, and then saying to the social media companies, well, this is what we're learning now, what are we going to do about it? So that I think will be the critical next step. But the learning for me there is there, there are ways, it took too long though, that was four years um, that it took us to really overcome that issue. Um, but I hope that that gives um, some encouragement that we are pushing past that. And sometimes that creative tension I talked about in the room uh, with other tech companies is, is really helpful for those debates. The second um, issue that, you know, right hitting the nail on the head, what do we do about uh, those who, who are uh, susceptible to disinformation? You know, we've, we've seen what it can do to liberal democracies uh, when that is writ large. We've had some very um, recent examples in a number of countries and it is devastating. Uh, here I, I track back again uh, now, there are those who are doing research on this, I believe, and particularly the likes of Colombia, which uh, are tracking back to look at what are the common themes that we're seeing in those who are most susceptible. But instincts will probably tell us quite a lot as well. And if you've got an inherent distrust of the state, probably at some point the state's failed you in some form. Now, that's a, that's a generalisation. Um, but if there's a general view that your economic position in life is influenced by the state and you are in a lower socioeconomic category and you are disenfranchised uh, or you've had an experience with the state, for instance, where at some point you've been in their care, these are um, some of the features that we see. And of course, educational attainment as well. Now, we need to track back then as governments think about what we can do to re-establish that trust in institutions. And it means by actually delivering for our people as they expect us to. It's as simple as that. When it comes down to the one-on-one, -on -one, I've had, I've tried to have conversations with people who are deep in conspiracy and it is an incredibly demoralizing experience. That's why I will always go back to the beginning. How do we stop people falling in in the first place? Caroline. Well, I would like to start with the second question because I think that's the main question for us as politicians. How can we gain trust again in institutions, in governments, in democracy as such. And I, I would say this is also the most difficult question to be answered. Uh, we are living in challenging times. Uh, this was mentioned already several times. And people are tired of crisis. And they want to believe easy solutions. And this is uh, really our problem. But uh, democracy is a hard work every day. And we have to fight for the trust of the people on a daily basis. So this is the only thing we can do. And we, had, we, we all have to be aware of the fact that you normally cannot find a solution which is beloved by everyone. So there will always be a certain amount of people, a group or something uh, like that, you, you can name it, uh, who is not happy with the decision. But democracy means that we find majorities. And this is something which was clear in the past and now it's not so clear. And one of the reasons is that, and this is also going to the, to the first question, that, they, that you can find misinformation, disinformation in the internet, that you find your group only echoing your opinion. And this is 
really something we found out, especially during the COVID pandemic, that is nearly impossible to get people out of such chambers if they are in these, yeah, in, in their opinions and surrounded by, the, by people who have the same opinion. So what we try to do is to regulate things in Europe and we would like to be a role model also for the world. That's why I'm very happy that I'm part of the leadership panel and that I can contribute also uh, from my experiences in Austria, but also at the European level. And again, we are not at the end uh, at this story. And regarding this third point, privacy versus safety, I think we need both of them. And it's always a challenge, and it has always been a challenge, to guarantee human rights. You always have the situation that the human right of the one person ends where the human right of the other person is infringed. And this is something we have to do on a daily basis, and what I did as a criminal judge in the courtroom on a daily basis. If someone wants to demonstrate, he can of course do that. But this right ends when uh, the body of, I don't know, another person or a policeman is injured. And, and also here, you have to find the balance, and this is what we have to do. So I would not be that um, pessimistic than uh, the person, I think it was a woman, who put the question to me that we can do both. We have to do both. Um, Jacinda has a hard stop at the top of the hour. So let me quickly answer, and then I want to ask Jacinda for her last stop thoughts on before we let you go, Jacinda. So the quick answer, the first question, um, the weakness of institutions in the global south um, and the countries that you mentioned are the countries where we have seen the regression of democracy, right? We've, and yes, in, in countries with authoritarian leaders, most of the time they are using these this technology to retain and to gain more power. How do we deal with that? We can talk about that more uh, after the panel. The second one, um, the cognitive bias that you mentioned, uh, it is there, but frankly, smart people think that they're immune from the behavior modification aspects of information warfare or information operations. We are all susceptible, and sometimes the smarter you are, the harder you fall, right? Um, this, is, uh, this is a problem. I think it's a problem for leaders. It is a problem for our shared reality. This is the reason why um, I have spoken out a lot more about the dangers, because without a shared reality, we cannot do anything together. Finally, the last one. Oh my God, I love your question, because privacy by design, trust, and safety by design. When the tech companies say that they cannot, it just means they won't because there is no regulation, no law, no civil society pressure to demand it. We deserve better. Let me throw it back to Jacinda Ardern for her closing thoughts. Oh, look, I think that you've traversed uh, a, uh, a set of you know, issues that are confronting, I think, all of us in different ways and cut across a range of other incredibly serious and important issues. How do you, how do you tackle climate change unless you have a shared reality around the problem definition? Um, the degree to which we see information integrity issues playing out in geostrategic issues, um, the fact that they're coupled with what would be considered traditional forms of warfare, um, there is a poly crisis and at uh, every level of that poly crisis, we see this extra layer of the challenges presented by um, technological developments that we've seen in recent times. But I'm an optimist and I'm an optimist because in the worst of times, I've been exposed to uh, the ability of human, humans to design solutions and rapidly adapt and implement solutions ultimately, for the most part, to protect humanity. And we have that within our capability. Um, we need to empower those who are specifically focused on doing that, who are dedicating themselves to it, often at great sacrifice. Uh, we need to support regulators who are focused on doing that. And we need to continue to just rally one another in what is an incredibly difficult space. So my final note to those in the room who are working in these areas, I acknowledge you and the work you do. It is incredibly tough going, um, but you are in the right place at the right time and your grandchildren will thank you for it. Thank you.
Thank you, Jacinda Ardern. Um, Caroline, your thoughts? Well, I can only second what Jacinda said. Uh, your grandchildren will thank you one day because it's the time now to create the future. And uh, these challenging and crucial times uh, need all of us. And I'm coming back what I already said. We cannot do it a alone as governments. We cannot leave it to the tech uh, enterprises. We cannot do it as politicians, no matter where you serve. We need all of us. We need to change society, to be aware of the challenges uh, ahead and stay optimistic. I really would like to conclude by stay optimistic. I think um, thinking back and learning from history, Normally it took about 100 years to get used to a new technology. And we are talking about the internet and we have got father of the internet, Windsurf, as our chair in the leadership panel and he invented the internet about 50 years ago. So we are halfway. It's the right time to set the legislation for the internet. It's the right time to be aware for the children, the parents, the grandparents, how to and what to do with, with the internet and all these uh, applications uh, we already use in our daily life and see the positive things, how we changed our life to the positive uh, since uh, we have all these technologies included in our daily life. So this is really what I try to, de to do. I'm really proud that I have the opportunity to contribute at that level, but that doesn't mean that it is more important than other levels. The contrary is the case. Everyone is needed in this process and we can only do it together. Fantastic. And the, the last thing I would say is everyone in this room, you are here for the Internet Governance Forum. It is, it is a pivotal moment. And they are so wonderfully optimistic. I'm probably a little more pessimistic, but it depends on what you do, right? It comes down to all of us. And I hate to say it that way. Uh, but it is this moment in time. Um, thank you so much, Right Honorable Jacinda Ardern, Minister Eckstatler, you guys in the room. We move to the main session. Thank you for coming and let's move. <laughs> <laughs>